So again, this is sort of an overview talk. I'm going to mostly I'm gonna go in depth on a couple of stories, but otherwise I'm going to try to hit some of the high points. Uh, our group mostly works in two areas, so uh, 3D cell culture and regenerative medicine, and also immunomodulatory biomaterials. And I'll be focusing most on the, uh, on the second, as Monty mentioned in his, his introduction. What holds these two sort of different areas together in our group is that we approach both from a perspective of using design proteins and peptides that have the ability to organize themselves into materials. So fibers and particles and gels and other supramolecular systems. One of the problems that our group struggles with kind of on a, a broad scale, and I think this is true uh, in biomedical engineering and especially in biomaterials, is that when you're trying to engineer in biology, biology puts up a fight, right? Because biology is, 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 is characterized by highly multifactorial uh, networks of signaling, of pathways, and the trick in engineering within these systems is to identify uh, engineerable pivot points within these. This is a, this is a, a graphical visualization of notch signaling uh, in Drosophila, right? And so, when you're designing a biomaterial, the, the main challenge is how do you discover appropriate combinations of signals to push a pathway in one direction, and then how to engineer a system that can deliver them uh, reproducibly across outbred populations of people who have their own uh, individualized uh, 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 specificities. Uh, and this is very true regardless of what half of our lab is, is operating, whether it's in digital engineering or whether it's in immunotherapy. So the way I've structured the talk today is I want to go through for about 20 minutes sort of introducing some of the proteins and peptides and molecules and materials that we've designed over the past few years. Uh, and then I'll get into a more, uh, a, a few selected examples uh, of some of the applications we're driving towards. So one of the peptides that we use quite a bit in our group is one that my first graduate student worked with. So this is Philip. Uh, Philip now, uh, just this past fall, started his own independent lab in the biomedical engineering department at LSU. Uh, and he worked with this peptide known as Q11. Uh, the property of this peptide that is so useful has multiple properties. Uh, so it self-assembles in salty solutions, so physiological buffers, physiological uh, fluids, uh, like serum, body fluid, uh, interstitial fluid. Uh, and when it's just in water, it's, it's pipettable and, 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 and it flows, it's fluid, uh, but when, then when we add buffers to it, it will gel. Um, I'll show you in another slide what the, what the nanostructure of these assemblies look like, um, but on this slide I want to show you that this molecule is also very easily functionalized. Mostly we functionalize on the end terminus, which is just the way it is because of the way we make the peptides on the synthesizer. Uh, but this peptide can still form the gels and the fibers when it's appended on one end with many different kinds of functional components. Uh, and the data over on the right is just showing, it's a little hard to see, uh, I'm sorry, it seems a little bit small, um, that when you combine peptides in a solution, mix them together, induce the gel formation, the stoichiometry of what you get in the gel matches what you started off with in the solution. And so we can have this mix and match kind of uh, style of, of assembling materials together. These are some uh, EM and TEM uh, micro, uh, uh, micrographs of the fibers. So here's Q11. And over the years, we have appended it with many different immune epitopes, B cell epitopes, T cell epitopes, cell binding ligands, polymers for changing the uh, chemical and physical properties of the, of the surface of these, of these fibers. And I think we, every time we go back and, and engineer a new variant of these, we're always surprised at just how tolerant this peptide is uh, at assembly when it has cargo attached to it. Um, we have found the edges of what it can, it can tolerate, and you need to include, for example, high amounts of charge, uh, uh, so one lysine is one positive charge, take multiple lysines to start to prevent these fibers from assembling into these kinds of structures. So that's the Q11 system. We'll come back to that because it's something that's been fairly central to a lot of our immunological work. 
Um, another platform that we have been working with, so was devised by a postdoc in my group, uh, who's now a few years into his assistant professorship at University of Florida's d and department. <coughs> and, excuse me. Uh, so I asked him to, and we started thinking about ways not to have short peptides assembled into these materials, but whole folded proteins, right? Because we wanted to assemble whole conformational antigens, uh, enzymes. We wanted to assemble cytokines and folded large, bulky whole proteins into these materials. And so what he, come up, he came up with was this uh, beta tail system. Uh, and in this system, what we have is a tail that can be appended on any expressed protein. And inside the E. coli, when you're doing the expression and afterwards when you're doing the purification, uh, it remains in a monomeric state, and it, and it does so by being in this alpha helix. That can be shifted into this beta sheet conformation that can then allow that protein with the tag on it to be entrapped into the fibers that I was showing you a couple slides earlier. Uh, and again, this is quite quantitative, uh, and I'll show you in a few slides how that's so. Uh, the yellow is not showing up really well, but you can monitor the helix to sheet transition, express nicely and, and purely. Uh, we also made a mutated one <coughs> that had a lot of uh, lysines and proline shot through it to mess up the folding, so we had something to compare with. Just grossly, if you look at the incorporation of these within nanofibers, this is a, you know, as simple as it gets. Uh, if you take the protein, express it, this is Greg's fingers holding it over a light box, uh, and you spin it down, the protein is not uh, sedimentable. Uh, but if we combine it with some of that Q11 fibrolysis protein, uh, it entraps within the nanofibers. These are the nanofibers, uh, and we can label the protein in those nanofibers with, with gold particles and amino gold labeling. Uh, and we can spin down those fibers and deplete all of the proteins. There's no more protein than the super. It's all down, attached within the fibers. You have a mutated uh, protein and you add the peptide to it, it's hard to see. You, 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 there's a pellet of fibers here, but it doesn't drag it into protein with it. And again, this is, this is uh, nearly quantitative, such that we can easily dose in different uh, proteins into the nanofibers. We've played around with fluorescent proteins, we've done uh, antigens uh, in some of the vaccine work that we've, we've been interested in. Uh, what I'm showing in this slide is both a fluorescent protein, which so there are two reasons why fluorescent proteins are, are so useful. You know, obviously one, they're fluorescent. Uh, but two, they're extremely stable, right? You can attach them, you can slap them on any other protein, and generally they retain their folding, they retain their function. Um, they wouldn't be used as ubiquitous as ubiquitous as they are if they didn't have that second property as well. Uh, they also don't make a particularly compelling example for if you want to show that your platform can incorporate different proteins, you know, you get, it's pretty easy to do fluorescent proteins because they're so stable. So we also do some <laughs> enzymes, including cutinase, uh, which is a lipase, uh, and it's much, uh, has a much lower melting temperature, it's much less stable uh, than GFP. And regardless of which one we're using, um, we can titrate one in, uh, have various combinations, titrate, titrate one out, the two are orthogonal, they don't mess up each other's assembly, and so we can easily dial in a fiber that has specified combinations of uh, one or more proteins. Hold that thought, I'll come back, I'll come back to that in a little bit. Another uh, part of our toolbox that we've uh, developed are known as Depsy peptides. So a Depsy peptide uh, is a, uh, a poly amino acid that has one or more of the amide bonds replaced by an ester bond. Okay. And amines are very stable, but esters can hydrolyze uh, in the same way that biodegradable sutures do. So when you have resorbable sutures after surgery, uh, those are composed of biodegradable esters. And uh, so we put esters in our self-assembling peptides, and again, this is Q11, and we had one or more uh, esters um, right in the central part of the peptide. And you know, I brought up the analogy of biodegradable sutures. Um, what controls the rate of their degradation is the hydrophobic environment around that ester bond. So those that have bulkier hydrophobic groups near that ester will degrade more slowly because there's less access to water. And so we use that example as inspiration uh, to change the side chain 
near this ester bond, and we found that really quite reproducibly and, and predictably, as you increase the, the hydrophobicity from glycine, which is just the hydrogen here, to alanine, which is a methyl group, so leucine and phenylalanine, we can dial up the, the length of time <coughs> those peptides reside before they, before they degrade. Um, this was uh, gratifying because we, we sort of had that engineering control over it, uh, but also because you know, we did this within amyloids, right? An amyloid, a beta sheet fiber, is extraordinarily stable, right? They don't do this. They don't degrade over time. Uh, whether they're pathological, like an A-beta, uh, Alzheimer's amyloid, or whether they're non-pathological, like some of the amyloids that are in all of our stomach, right now, the uh, E. coli uh, that we have that create things called curly fibers. Uh, but Having one that dissolves in two weeks uh, was certainly uh, something that has never been done uh, with a beta sheet fiber before. So we were excited about having that tool in our toolbox as well. So when I start talking about the immunology, you'll see how important it is for multiple epitopes, T cell epitopes and B cell epitopes, uh, to reside together in the same fiber. And this is very easily controllable simply uh, based on when we combine the peptides during these assembly processes. So by either uh, mixing them in dry powders and bringing them through the full assembly process, we can have a fiber that contains two or more uh, epitopes, or we can have them self-sort into two distinct fibers. You can turn on and off the immunogenicity by having a B cell and T cell epitope together or apart. And I'll show that to you uh, when we get into that, into that part of the talk. So one of the ways that we showed uh, in our paper uh, on the beta sheet uh, proteins is that, uh, that we could target a specified combination of proteins. And again, when we get to the amount, this is so important to have a predictable number and identity of different epitopes. Um, the way we chose to do that is by using color, because if you've ever painted a wall, I was painting my office this past weekend, uh, the human eye can really distinguish different shades of color. Uh, with really quite exquisite uh, uh, specificity. Uh, and so what we did, we thought this would be kind of a fun way to show that if we had three different fluorescent proteins that assembled, they all had the beta tails on them, uh, we would predict that if we wanted to target a gray color, we'd have to mix them, in, you know, like you would in Photoshop, by picking your color uh, in an equal, equal ratio, equal molar, you know, one third, one third, one third ratio. And when we did that and induced assembly to a gel, uh, we got a, uh, a gray gel uh, in plus across the field. Uh, and so, okay, this is kind of fun. Let's start playing around. Uh, we said, let's try to make pink. We got pink, teal, orange, yellow. Uh, and then when we wanted to, to show that our, our system, you know, uh, this was a result of the, of the beta tail uh, and the proper function of the beta tail, we, we threw our mutate one in there, uh, which can't assemble in those uh, fibers and it totally threw, threw, threw the color branching off. So, Joe, yeah, yeah. a quick question. Yeah. So, we, we did this experiment that you use the purified mm -hmm. proteins that yeah. control the ratio, yeah, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, is that actually critical, or can you have also self assembly directly from the nitrate? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we're using ELPs right now, we're using brushes. Oh, right to purify from the lysate now with the temperature cycle. So we're just doing a fantastic thing here. Because, uh, but we use a, his, you know, a nickel column you know, in his bag to purify the proteins first. Um, I don't think we did the experiment that you're mentioning right out of lysate. Uh, we preferred to start with you know, uh, um, you know, pure protein. <laughs> We could sort of quant. We knew how much you know we're, we're in our P. We knew you know what that number meant because we had to share the stocks of them. Um, so I don't know. You, you might be able to pull them out of a lysate uh, with that as well, um, but I'm not sure. So what this opens up. So um, <coughs> we have these modular engineerable systems that are made of molecules and tools that we ourselves make and have on a shelf. Um, biology is sort of resistant to multifactorial engineering. Uh, and so even though things like design of experiments 
are common in other engineering disciplines, like especially chemical engineering, chemical process design, microelectronics industry, right? This is a bread and butter technique for getting processes, uh, reactions, <laughs> flows, uh, to, uh, to be optimized, it's, it's very rarely used in biology because biology doesn't lend itself to I want to control five factors at the same time and have gradated control over each of them to create a matrix and do an experiment to find out where my optimum is. Uh, the systems that we're designing are more amenable to that than, uh, say, a decellularized scaffold that you might pull out of the tissue and have very little engineering control over many of those factors. Uh, so for one example to show you, uh, this is an experiment where, uh, and again, the resolution is not great on this, so uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so this is three different um, cell binding ligands. And this is sort of a formulation space that you're looking at. And we ran uh, a, a multifactorial design experiment where we could change the concentration of multiple of the ligands. And we can look in different areas of conformation space. And lo and behold, when we did that, um, we found different results. So as I think we probably all intuitively expect when we look at complicated biological systems, but don't necessarily sort of go through the laborious process of looking at lots of different concentrations of all these multiple factors. Um, so what we saw is that uh, for example, with RGB, which is cell binding ligand, compared to YIGSR, uh, the only thing that mattered in this particular concentration range of the two, which is the red box here, is that you had to have more RGB. So in this area of formulation space, uh, YIGSR, YIGSR uh, which binds different uh, integrants than RGB, uh, didn't really have an effect, only RGB did. Okay. So we went to a bigger space, and we found that after a certain threshold, it doesn't matter how much RGB you have, it sort of levels out. Okay, so when we dial in to a more uh, defined window of formulation space, here, uh, at the optimum amount of RGB, all of a sudden that second ligand has this big negative effect. It only revealed itself once we were getting close to uh, the right amount of RGB. And I think this is true of many of the systems that we work in. And it's not easy when you make a covalent gel or a material, a culture system, a vaccine, uh, to know that you're in the right area and that the manipulations that you make on one or more of the factors <coughs> means that that's a glo globally true for, for all formulations, right? Uh, and so we continue to apply this kind of thinking uh, as we move into into uh, the vaccine space as well. So let's let's move into a little bit more of some of the applications that we've been doing recently. <coughs> so if I had to pick one experiment uh, that was the most, you know, earth-shaking, transformational, uh, you know, things were different after Jay plopped this data on our you know, Ruby <coughs> table than the moment it was before. Uh, it, it was this one. So, so Jay was a postdoc in my group. Uh, he's now an assistant professor at the uh, uh, University of Texas Medical Branch. And the experiment was that we had started to sort of obliquely look at the immune responses against Q11. We wanted to know if it was immunogenic because we were doing tissue engineering, we were doing cell delivery. And it wasn't. We couldn't see any immune response at all. It was this situation, right? Here's Q11 and PBS. These are the titers of antibodies, and there's just no immune response. So what Jay did very cleverly was, well, why don't we put a uh, peptide that has a B cell and a T cell epitope within it and attach it to Q11 uh, and see what happens then. Because if that doesn't raise a response, then nothing will. <coughs> what he saw was not just that it arose a response, <coughs> but that it arose a very strong uh, antibody response. Okay? So these are antibody titers in mice. Uh, this control group is taking that same epitope and it's just a short peptide from egg, chicken egg, and uh, uh, it's, it's a really, really commonly used immune epitope that's been around for, for decades. Uh, and it's sort of a bizarre epitope because it has both a T cell epitope and a B cell epitope in, in the sequence, which is kind of unusual for peptide sequences. But anyway, uh, he 
he got when, when that epipeptide <coughs> was formulated with a really strong adjuvant, Freund's adjuvant, and Freund's is the strongest adjuvant known to humanity. If you if you work with it, uh, you know it's the best way to generate an antibody response. It's also very toxic. I cooks don't tend to like to use it very much for that reason. It's absolutely not feasible in, in a human uh, because it's uh, raises a lot of inflammation. It's a mineral oil emulsion. Uh, with crushed up tuberculosis bacterium uh, in it. Okay, so it has all the, uh, it's a part particulate, right? So that, that it has adjuvanting properties. Uh, it has all the co-like receptor ligands that are present inside tuberculosis. Um, and so it's just, it's just very strong. But we were getting immune responses, you know, on the level of CFA. And in the experiments that we've done since then, uh, there have, Occasionally been this high, sometimes less high, uh, but always, you know, usually up in the tighter four, tighter five kind of range for our, for our materials. So when Jay, you know, put this, showed this to the rest of the group, you know, we kind of had, what are we going to do with this? Are we going to sort of keep going the way we were going, or are we going to are we going to make a, a a shift? And you know, we decided that we would see if we could uh, take this really interesting property. Uh, and try to make it into, try to utilize it for, for a therapeutic effect, and to try to understand what these immune responses might mean when we're not trying to raise, when we're not actively seeking an immune response for a therapeutic effect. What if we are trying to deliver some cells? Can we tolerate some of these antibody responses? If so, what are the phenotype, what are the duration, what are the levels of the antibody responses that could be tolerated? <coughs> Over the ensuing years, we have come, so in, in multiple papers from us and from others, uh, we've come to find out that, that this property of self assembly of, of protein aggregates, is common, right? Uh, whether it's this system I just showed you that, that, that Jay worked on first, or whether it's a, a coiled coil, the peptide, polymer, hydrogel, whether it's a totally different structure, still making fibers uh, and still oligomerized and, and highly multivalent. Uh, whether it's Greg's beta sheet uh, or beta tail protein, whether it's peptide amplifiers that have been studied by other groups like like Matt group in Chicago, all these as a class of materials raise fairly compellingly large immune responses, and so we we set out to characterize you know what what makes these immune responses what they are, what can we do with them, uh, uh, you know, uh, therapeutically. Okay, so these are the two questions that, that have been driving a lot of our work. How can we actively make use of these responses? And what does this mean uh, for other applications of these biomaterials? So, we're going to get into a little bit of immunology now. Uh, and for those of you who aren't uh, inclined, <laughs> uh, this slide should help at least uh, show you some of the main players. Uh, Three cell types, the antigen presenting cell, the T cell, and the B cell. When a material, um, and so I basically adapted this from another more uh, classical uh, uh, figure in a review paper, where up here it's you know a virus, but now it's been biomaterialized, so we have a <laughs> material coming in here. Uh, and there are different epitopes on here. So some of the epitopes are red, you'll see, and some of them are blue. The red ones I've designated as B cell epitopes, and the blue ones are B cell epitopes. So the antigen presenting cell will, uh, you know, survey the tissue, uh, and if it's if the if the material is delivered intramuscularly, subcutaneously, intraperitoneally, uh, intranasally, we've got we're doing work in that in that delivery route as well. Uh, antigen presenting cells, uh, phagocytosis. Uh, they take it up through a number of mechanisms, but then when that happens, they start chopping it up into pieces. And some of those pieces end up in the major histocompatibility complex, the type 2 MHC, and those are known as T cell epitopes. Because that MHC peptide is presented to a T cell with their T cell receptor, uh, and when the T cell that happens to be clonal for that sequence that makes it in there, uh, when it detects it, along with other co-stimulatory molecules that the APC is also providing, uh, it becomes activated, proliferates, differentiates, and can take on a number of different phenotypes. OK? 
Okay. What allows the APC to to uh, produce these co-stimulatory molecules is usually the sensing of some kind of danger uh, at that site where the uh, where it's encountering the antigen. Okay, so keep that in mind. On this half of the slide, you have what's going on with B cells. B cells also are antigen presenting cells, and they take up the material uh, analogously to what happens with with antigen presenting cells, like the dirty cells. Um, but they do it by a receptor mediated endocytosis, where they bind to the B cell receptor specific or the B cell uh, epitope specifically via their B cell receptor. Okay, so this B cell is clonal for that blue shape. Okay, so it takes it up, chops it up, and now the red parts, the T cell epitopes, make it into the MHC. Okay, now T cells that have been activated by this axis find these T cells uh, that. So this, let's find this B cell that uh, is clonal for that B cell epitope and give it cytokine help. Depending on what those cytokines are, uh, it gives the phenotype of the antibodies that then come out. So there can be antibodies that bind complement, antibodies that don't bind complement, uh, uh, and, and whether or not they differentiate into plasma cells. There are many different kinds of antibodies. Okay, so that's the main pathway, a lot, and that's just the most boiled down. Uh, there are a lot of things that happen in parallel. But what's critical <clears throat> is uh, which epitopes are up in the materials to start with, the T-cell epitopes and the B-cell epitopes, and, and we'll come back to that. So the one application that I want to dive uh, with a little bit more detail uh, into is known as adaptive immunotherapy. So right now, <clears throat> if you happen to have a, uh, a chronic inflammatory condition, like rheumatoid arthritis, or ulcerative colitis, or Crohn's disease, uh, the main treatment for this is an anti-TNF antibody, right? So a uh, tumor necrosis factor, right? Humira uh, would be the poster child, and there are several other commercialized uh, uh, versions of it. I actually just got approved for a generic uh, very recently. Um, it's an anti TNF antibody <coughs> made by uh, Abbott, AbbB. Um, it used to be that you had to go in and get an injection. Now they've made an auto injector, EpiPen like pen style uh, kind of delivery device. Uh, and it actually it's, it's, it's one of the most blockbuster pharmaceuticals that's ever, that's ever been. Uh, however, it has a number of limitations, as do all passive immunotherapies, which is what this is. One, many patients are not responsive. So there's a 15 to 20 percent non-responsiveness of individuals to start with, right out of the gate. Two, the repeated injections every two weeks or every month, depending on the severity of the disease, for the duration of the disease, and if it's something, uh, you know, like uh, uh, arthritis, could be for the rest of the patient's life, uh, causes issues. One, it's, there's a compliance issue, just going back and doing it every every uh, two weeks, which the EpiPen in style helps with. But it doesn't help with the fact that that reproduced delivery over and over again leads to the formation of neutralizing antibodies, right? The, uh, even, even in a humanized uh, antibody, okay? Uh, and this leads to um, non-responsiveness over time of, of a large proportion of the patients. Uh, it's also quite expensive, uh, and there can be off-target effects as well for this model. The alternative is, and this is something that doesn't exist yet, uh, but is the idea of ours and a number of other labs, is what if we could raise those antibodies in the patient's body, uh, not rely on delivering them uh, from a manufactured source, right? That's known as active immunotherapy. And as I mentioned, this does not exist yet uh, against cytokines in current clinical practice. And part of the reason is because you really have to thread an immunological needle to achieve this, right? What we want are the antibodies that are going to go off and deplete the TNF in the circulation. But there are different forms of TNF. There's a circulating form. There's a membrane-bound form. We don't want to react with the membrane-bound form. Uh, and we don't want to kill the cells that are producing TNF. Right? You need some level of TNF to fight off infection, and uh, you know if you, if you ablate the patient's ability to produce TNF at all, uh, that's greatly diminished. 
uh, that would also lead to a lot of inflammation if you're killing cells uh, uh, in an autoimmunity, the autoreactive kind of way. So we just want those antibodies. Okay? Uh, and more, moreover, the phenotype of those antibodies needs to be non-inflammatory. I mentioned that there's some antibodies that might complement, some don't. Some are more associated with inflammatory responses, some are less associated with inflammatory responses. Some are associated with al allergic responses, like IgE. We don't want those. Uh, we want to dial in the phenotype of those antibodies. Right now, that's not possible to be done uh, with existing platforms. One, because they depend on uh, adjuvants, right, which often, by their very nature, are inflammatory. Uh, and there's little latitude for adjusting epitope content and other possibly co-stimulatory molecules that are in the vaccine so that we can actively generate the very precisely controlled phenotype that we're after. Okay. And so this has been a target of our uh, Q11 system. And what we did is we designed a peptide that has a detailed epitope from CNS. This was published in the literature. This is not one that we discovered. Uh, but it's a, it's a sequence from uh, human TNF. Uh, and so we looked at human, and in, in our mouse studies, we used mouse TNF, uh, where this is only exposed in the circulating version of, of TNF, right? So antibodies raised against this should not re react against the membrane-bound TNF. Uh, and, and that was shown in, in, a, in a prior uh, set of publications, not, not by our group. So that's the B cell epitope, okay? The T cell epitope, remember I said we don't want any T cell responses against your own cellular <coughs> components, right? So we use a T cell epitope uh, that's completely, so there's nothing in your proteome that looks like this, uh, in part because they're two D alanines, so the wrong stereoisomer from basically what life is made out of. Uh, we're all L alpha amino acid based uh, animals. Uh, and so there are two D alanines, and there's a cyclohexyl alanine, that's what the X is. You don't have a lot of cyclohexyl alanine inside you, uh, in, in your protein. So this is a, a non-self uh, T cell epitope. It also happens to strongly bind most T cell, uh, uh, most, most MHCs in different individuals or different HLAs and different mice strains as well. Okay. So we made co-assemblies of these two peptides without any other adjuvanting molecules. Here are the fibers made of the B-cell epitope, the T-cell epitope, and together. And when we immunize mice with this, if there's no padre help, there's no antibody response at all. But if the two peptides are together, shown here in the full, in the full fiber, you get a nice, uh, reasonably high and durable antibody response. So those antibodies that are raised react you know, of course, against what we immunize with, which is, I'm showing you a little um, green squiggly that represents the B-cell epitope, but they also, they also react against the whole TNF protein. There are no antibodies, on the other hand, being raised against that T-cell epitope component. There are no anti-padre antibodies uh, that, are, that are formed, okay? And only mice that have been immunized with the two together raise any antibodies at all. If there's a scrambled version of the B-cell epitope, there are no uh, TNF reactive antibodies, uh, and if it lacks the T cell help, uh, there's no uh, reactive antibodies either. So why, why do you need that T cell epitope if nothing is going to happen as a result of it being there? Right. So if you go back to uh, that, yeah. so <coughs> so there are so B cells can react to a very limited set of things uh, without T cell help. So. There's some, there's some really like highly polyvalent, uh, like a polymer with like a hapten on, on, attached to it, like a chemical uh, hapten. Uh, you can get a sort of a non, sort of low affinity antibody response directly when a B cell ligates that kind of material. And we thought maybe that might be going on with ours because there's some structural similarities between our really polyvalent materials and the ones that have been sort of uh, study for T independent B cell responses. But as it turns out, these materials absolutely require T cell help. They need this half of the axis going on for any of that to happen. And we've just found that out experimentally by, by, by looking at both. Um, 
And that's certainly the most common. I mean, that's the way most antigens are constructed. And then that's basically to prevent autoreactivity. Um, you have a lot of B cells that are floating around that, that could react to uh, epitopes that are, that are autologous. And the lack of that help to allow them to do this is one major part of, of you know, how, how you, don't, you don't have autoreactivity to all those. Um, so we're providing that help to allow them to do that, but we're doing it with an epitope that is out that has nothing to do with anything. A person or a mouse or, you know, it's, it's absolutely exogenous. So another, <laughs> um, uh, another property of these materials that we noticed uh, by, just by looking is that they're highly non-inflammatory. And this seems to be a property of not just um, our self-assemblies that we look at, but if you look at other groups that use similar you know, self-assembling materials and look histologically, they rarely evoke any kind of local tissue response. Um, and if you didn't look for antibodies, you would conclude there's no new response going. Well, this is, this is now, so this is the opposite. So. Uh, you conclude for self-assembled materials, peptides like this, that there's there's very little uh, immune response going on. Um, to compare, so if you immunize a mouse's foot pad with an alum adjuvanted vaccine formulation, and this is common, uh, this is the most common human adjuvant. Uh, flu shot, right? You get a little welt, it hurts. Uh, that's alum adjuvanted. Um, so the mouse's foot pad will swell a little bit. The color's not gray on the on the projection, but there are a lot of purple cells in here. Those are neutrophils that have infiltrated. Uh, if you look at a, a foot pad of any tissue site, we, we actually really struggle with these experiments because we have a hard time finding the immunization site. Um, so we slice through everywhere where we inject it. And it's very difficult to find uh, any kind of local tissue response. Um, if you look grossly at a mouse's foot pad, uh, they swell up to a millimeter, and it's only a millimeter thick to start with, so you've got doubling of the size of a foot pad uh, with an alimentary <coughs> vaccine, and there's just there's no swelling uh, measurable when it's immunized with peptides. Uh, we look deeper at this. If you look in the peritoneal space, and you look for cells that will have infiltrated that would indicate inflammation, macrophages, monocytes, eosinophils, alum generates a big response that way, the ovoq 11 peptide is very minimal response that way. And that's true whether you're looking at the infiltrating cells or uh, the cytokines that would indicate uh, uh, inflammation, inflammatory cytokines. So another property that we noticed, and this was work done by Rebecca Pompano, who is now running her own lab in the, in the chemistry department at, at UVA, um, is that so, you know, I showed you that example with the cell culture and the RGD and the cells you know, proliferating when we had the right combination of, of uh, cell binding ligands. So we did an analogous experiment uh, in a vaccine situation. And so Rebecca had one amount of the B cell epitope, uh, and this was done in the context of a, of a MRSA vaccine, so a vaccine against uh, antibiotic resistant staph. Right? Uh, um, so when she titrated in different amounts of the T cell helper epitope, she got not only different amounts of, of antibody response, but differing T cell responses, depending on where she was uh, in those formulations. Uh, and this was just totally empirical, not something we could have guessed, uh, but it was an experiment that was made much easier to do uh, because we could easily combine and make five or six different vaccines trivially by just pipetting the peptides together uh, in different amounts. And so this, you know, to an engineer, looks like an optimization curve, right? You can pick the formulation, experimentally, empirically, that had the best antibody titers. Uh, what was a little more surprising was that the T cell phenotypes also shifted around depending on the ratio of B cell to T cell epitope. So down in this kind of ratio, we had a uh, favoring of TH1 and TH2 cells, whereas up in this one, there's a favoring of T molecular helper cells, which are the cells in the spleen <coughs> that help the antibody response. So it's uh, not that surprising in retrospect to see that these curves track each other. 
but it's a fairly simple way, just by mixing the peptides around, uh, which is trivial to do with two pipettes. Um, I always am wearing, I try not to say trivial, and it's never me with the pipettes in my hands. So, <laughs> It's pretty easy compared to making a new vaccine every time. <laughs> uh, you can make a range of formulations and experimental look which ones give you the phenotypes you're interested in. So, we, so back to the TNF uh, story, we did this in the TNF situation, and uh, again, we got this sort of uh, optimization curve when we added in more and more of the Padre epitope. So we could pick this one to go forward with because it's giving us the best and most reliable titers. Um, as an aside, we've looked at other T cell epitopes that are also exogenous. Here's one from uh, Vaccinia. And different T cell epitopes have different shapes of that curve. So it's a little hard to predict. I think that this sort of empirical approach is valuable because we can just look and find out for a given epitope, a given combination of epitopes, which one uh, gives you the response that's, that's most uh, suited to what you're interested in. So, so that was the B cell and antibody response. If you look at what's going on with the T cells, and again, these are T cells only responding to that exogenous epitope, so not, not a self epitope. Uh, but they're fairly strong T cell responses. Uh, these are called the Ellie spot experiments where you immunize the mouse, you take out their lymph nodes, you culture their cells on a, on a plate. Uh, you stimulate them with different, the different peptides that are immunized, and if the cell produces a cytokine, it will stick to the plate and you can count how many spots, uh, and that's what the, that's what the data uh, reflects. So, um, you know, higher bars means more responding T cells. Um, on this half of the slide, our T cells producing IL-4, which is the classic TH2 cytokine. On the other side of the slide, our cells producing interferon gamma, which is the classic TH1 cytokine. TH1, more inflammatory, TH2, less inflammatory. Um, you can see overall that there are more T cells producing IL-4, less in the scale bars producing interferon gamma, and there are no T cells producing any of the more inflammatory TH1 phenotype against the B cell epitope. There's a couple of non-zero cells responding uh, you know, that are TH2 cells, but in certain formulations, you can even Avoid that just about all altogether. So again, there's kind of a curve to this, uh, depending on how uh, how uh, stringent we want to be about making sure there are no T cells responding to Padre or to the to the TNF epitope. Or we can select different uh, combinations of these at different epitope ratios that, that give us the phenotype we're interested in. Okay, so let's look at <clears throat> the protection assay that we did, which is which was very exciting. So. Um, right now, Yi in our group is working out models of chronic inflammation uh, and, and arthritis. Uh, the first model that we've looked at this uh, is a more acute inflammation where you take LPS, lipopolysaccharide, you squirt it into the peritoneum, uh, and the mouse gets acutely uh, inflammatory, and if not treated, uh, they die in about 12 hours. Okay? Um, our IACUC you know, uh, sacrifice uh, cutoff was that when they lose temperature down to 32 degrees. So when mice get inflammation, they get cold, uh, opposite of, of humans, but uh, that is how mice behave. Um, so that was our, our euthanasia cutoff, and mice that are untreated, the green ones die by 12 hours, okay, uniformly, bam. Um, mice that were treated with, so we tried a couple different formulations, they all got a little bit sick, and one mouse sort of breached the sacrifice uh, level, but then they all recovered, right? So we had near 100% recovery uh, of the treated mice. Uh, mice obviously don't get any LPS, so obviously it's fine. So we were really excited about that. I mentioned when introducing active immunotherapy that um, you want to have a response that isn't so vigorous that it prevents the mouse or the patient from being able to fight off infection, right? So uh, we went back and looked at listeria clearance uh, in these mice that have been vaccinated. If a mouse is given uh, an anti-TNF antibody, for example, uh, and you uh, deliver uh, listeria intra intraperitoneally, uh, they will get a certain load of listeria in their spleen and in their liver as they begin to clear this. And 
mice that have been treated with the anti-TNF antibody have higher levels in their liver and their spleen, uh, meaning they are more slowly uh, fighting off and clearing that bacteria. Our immunized mice, on the other hand, had uh, no difference in the amount of listeria in their livers and spleen uh, when they had been immunized. Whether they've been immunized with the full vaccine that's raising mice high antibody titers against the TNF or a control vaccine uh, that isn't raising those antibody titers. So uh, another sort of theme that our sort of newly incarnated group at Duke has really been thinking a lot about is trying to get more detailed about the phenotypes of the immune response that are being raised. Trying to understand, you know, it's more than just the titer of the immune response. It's about the, the kinds of the, the phenotypes. And I've touched on Th1, Th2 a little bit. And this is another example of that. Um, we thought, okay, let's see what happens if we try to get a higher antibody response or a bigger antibody response. We added uh, an adjuvant. Usually we don't add adjuvants because one of the advantages of doing things with peptides is you don't have to use an adjuvant. But here we did add uh, CPG, uh, which is a, a DNA-based adjuvant. And they raised slightly stronger titers. Actually, they're statistically equivalent uh, titers compared to the unadjuvanted. Uh, but what happened is that our protection took a hit. Now these mice, several of them died in our groups, uh, whereas the, again, the unadjuvanted mice survived almost uniformly. Uh, and that was very curious. So we also reproduced it. So this experiment we started doing, well, these experiments, this whole study, we started doing in Chicago. Um, so Carolina Morisolano is still a graduate student who, who's up there. She's going to be defending her thesis in a couple of months. Um, and after moving, we thought, let's revisit this. This was kind of a really surprising, you know, exciting response, if it were true. So Yi did experiments again, more groups of mice, different animal facility, different peptides. The peptides were made afresh in our new situation here. Uh, and, and so the, uh, these groups reflect um, both uh, together. So they really reproduced beautifully. So we're, we're pretty excited about the robustness of this. Uh, but back to the, uh, the CPG experiment. So, um, you know, it, it compromised our protection here. And we haven't gotten to the bottom of exactly why this is, but we've made some correlations that we're following up on. And one correlation is about the Th1, Th2 polarization. So we compared, again, the T cells producing interferon gamma and IL4 um, in both situations, whether it had CPG or not. And the ones that have no adjuvant are strongly Th2. So this is 0.2, and it's a little hard to see. That that's 0.2, meaning a 5 to 1 ratio of, of Th2 cells to Th1. And this is exactly the reciprocal of that. This is a 5 to 1 ratio the other way. Um, and we've done some studies in wound healing, where I'm, I'm, I don't have time, so I'm not showing that study. Where we've also seen this punitive nature of a Th1 biased uh, antibody response, uh, and, and T cell response uh, as well. Um, and so we think this is a pretty critical part of making these materials successful, and we're continuing to sort of really lock that down with some, some better controls. Overall, you know, this is the kind of way we think about our vaccines. We're wanting to dial up and down for a given situation, and, and we you know, I'm not talking about some of these uh, other studies that we've done in different diseases, malaria, MRSA, flu, uh, wound healing. Uh, but overall, our, our goal is to dial up and down, independently if possible, each of these kinds of factors which can set the success or failure of, of the technology. Do we want a phase two response to try to achieve that? Um, what kind of antibodies do we want? Most of what you've been seeing is IgG1, those are the majority titers. Uh, do we want low affinity polyclonal antibodies or high affinity nearly monoclonal antibodies? If there's T cell help, uh, well, if there's T cell engaged, do we want it to be CD4 helper T cells or CD8 uh, uh, cytotoxic T cells? And another question that we're continuing to think about is how long do we want these responses to endure? Lifetime, months, weeks, uh, that's a pretty critical piece of the uh, active immunotherapy situation. There's only five minutes left. Uh, there are a couple of short stories that I'm afraid I'm going to have to skip over. Sorry, uh, just to give time for questions. 
just, I guess, to hit the high point, uh, Yao Ying in our group has devised this really cool new platform that <coughs> makes fibers, but uh, they're totally alpha helical, right? So we don't have to even think about designing with amyloids or beta sheet fibers. This is an entirely helical fiber uh, that has the same self-adjuvanting property. Uh, and we're collaborating with the Samson group, uh, looking at these in uh, vaccines for glioblastoma. So really exciting and really new work uh, here at Duke. Um, and another one, just sort of a one minute you know, overview. In some situations, we don't want a response at all. We want to just turn the response entirely off, right? What if we're trying to engineer a cell delivery device uh, and the ligand that allows those cells to be happy in the matrix happens to have a B cell epitope in it and a T cell epitope? What are you going to do? Uh, and I think that's the case in, in many of the biomolecular platforms that we see published. Uh, so Yi in our group did a really nice study where he looked at changing the surface charge on the fibers. You've got positively charged fibers, negatively charged fibers based on whether they have lysines in them or, or glutamates in them. This is just data potential measurements. Um, and what he found was that by loading up the surface of the fiber with negative charge, you could absolutely shut off the immune response to them. Here's the titer, just gone, right? A little bit of negative charge really started to diminish the response. A lot of negative charge, gone. Uh, and so we were excited about that. He did some really nice work uh, with um, uh, a recorder cell and showed that the reason it's gone is that the antigen presenting cells don't pick it up and process it, process it, process it, and those peptides never end up in the MHC. Uh, so some interesting sort of new tools that we're really having fun playing with. All right, so that's uh, pretty much the end of the talk. Uh, a few points, you know, we're, we're having fun and I think making some interesting tools that are, that are really useful, especially in applications like academia therapy uh, because of their inherently non-inflammatory uh, nature and their ability to raise antibody responses without a lot of other uh, responses that go along with it. Uh, we're continuing to expand our toolbox. You know, Tosh's group has been so great. We're making a lot of proteins to push these immune, immune responses in different directions. We've got new collaborations with uh, the Samson group, with Sally Permar, uh, as I mentioned, with Tosh. Uh, and, you know, uh, I, I'm really proud of the group that we're building and expanding. We've gone from three to ten in the past year, and, you know, we're just keeping going. So thanks for. Uh, you know, having uh, such a warm and uh, uh, welcoming reception for us, uh, you know, here's to the future.